Good morning. Welcome to worship uh, here with us at Luther Seminary. We're so glad you're with us today. Um, this morning we have our preacher is Eric Hill and I'm just seeing you. We're excited to have Eric with us as well as Daphne Urban and the intern who will be assisting this morning. We're excited to have them guiding us in worship. We also have Mary Preuss and Tom Witt, as always, faithfully leading us in music. So with that, we're excited you're with us and, and let's get started with worship. God, in abundance, you give us more than we need. We come to you this morning wanting to hold lightly the fading things of unimportance and to grasp tightly the to us for daily food, for health, for each breath we take, for your whole creation. We are overwhelmed when we consider how you have entrusted so much to us. May we be worthy of that trust. May we be a people who are unafraid to live as fully and as richly as you want us to live. What? changing treasure truly beyond all value. Your generosity and goodness astound us. Inspire us to today teach your commandments and share your good news for the sake of the world. Even when we feel your presence slipping away, you entrust to us the future of your rule of justice and love. Give us the grace to work out with you the growth of mercy and goodness in our world. Thank you. 
25th chapter of Matthew. Jesus said to the disciples, For it is if a man going on a journey summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. The one who had received the five talents went off at once and traded with them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had the two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. Then the one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents, see, and I have made five more talents. His master said to him, well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one with the two talents also came forward saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I have made two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Then the one who had received the one talent also came forward saying, Master, I knew that you were a harsh man reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid and I went and I hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master replied, you wicked and lazy slave. You knew, did you, that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I do not scatter? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers and on my return, I would have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one with 10 talents. For to all those who have, more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. As for this worthless slave, throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So what are we to do with this text? All of us, no doubt, are familiar with this parable. Many of us probably have heard it even in our Sunday school classes. And whether you recognize it from this version from the Gospel of Matthew or perhaps the, the variation of it in the Gospel of Luke, it is one that is familiar to us. And if we're honest with ourselves, and if we're not careful, it's an open invitation to bad theology, especially in our culture where the gospel of prosperity persists. But surely God has more to say in this text than simply money, money, money. And what are we to do with this harsh master who reaps where he does not sow, who gathers where he does not scatter seed? Is this supposed to be a stand-in for Christ? Is this how we should read this text? Is this the same Christ of the Beatitudes who said, Blessed are the merciful, for they will see God, who said, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth. There does seem to be a bit of a disconnect between this slave and harsh master metaphor. It's true that we recognize God as a God of justice, but isn't it also true that our God sits on the seat of mercy? So then what are we left with? Where do we go with this text? Perhaps if we break it down differently, the Spirit of God will speak to us in a countercultural way, a way that speaks not as a reflection of this world, but as a revelation of the world to come. 
Perhaps we need to begin with the context and placement of this scripture. Now, scholars and researchers tell us that the Gospel of Matthew was written somewhere around the mid 80s of the first century. So we know that the early church was no doubt aware of the ministry of Christ. They no doubt knew about his crucifixion. And many knew, if not actually having witnessed, the destruction of the temple in the year 70. So it is at this time that the early church, the early Christians, are no doubt a people struggling for a clear identity, perhaps not too different from today's 21st century church, perhaps not too different than what we as a nation are experiencing. And as they leaned into this uncertainty, no doubt asking themselves questions, who are we as a people? What are we called to be and do in this world? And how do we go forward into a future that is uncertain? This parable is couched within a series of eschatological passages that speak into the great parousia of Christ. And many of Christ's followers thought the second coming of Christ would be imminent. Some scholars believe evidence of this can be found in some of Paul's letters. But the author of Matthew is clear when he conveys that while the coming of the Son of Man is to be expected, the day and the hour are unknown. So we are called upon through these passages to be ready, to keep awake, and to prepare for Christ's return. And we are left with this question. As Christians, what are we to do while we await Christ's return? And how might this parable help us? In answering this question, we need to recognize that we have actually been here before. We are familiar with this arrangement outlined in the parable when one entrusts something of value to another putting them in a place of responsibility. And it sounds like this. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, God created humankind in the image of God and gave them dominion over all of creation. You see, we do not worship a harsh master. We worship and glorify a loving God who, as Gonzalez puts it, creates us as something beyond God's self to help steward God's creation. In this now but not yet moment of the parousia, we experience God's love for creation, which is manifested not only in the divine presence, but also in the divine absence. Henry Nouwen reminds us that the great temptation of the ministry of Christ, I say it again, the great temptation of the ministry of Christ is to celebrate only the presence of the Lord while forgetting the absence. Just as divine presence is a sign of love, so too is divine absence when the parent recedes from the forefront and invites the child to try his or her wings, even at the risk of pain and failure. And so it is in this parable, the slaves are given dominion over the master's wealth. They are each given talents according to his abilities, an extraordinary amount of wealth, king for a day, to try on and to try out their hand at managing the master's estate. And the charge is clear. The master places great importance on wealth, thus creating the expectation for the slaves that while the master is away, they must produce more wealth. And for the one who does not, their reward 
is the master's harsh punishment. Which brings us to our place in this story as Christians, as followers of Christ. In this time of waiting for Christ's return, we, like the slaves, are not expected to merely sit on our hands, to put ourselves in a hole. There's an expectation that we are active in the world around us. And so the question becomes, what might we be doing if we are entrusted with God's abundant creation? That is, what does our creator value? We've already established our reward for faithful service does not come from financial prosperity for us or for our master. Ours comes from faithfully following and serving the mission and purpose of Christ, our Lord and Savior, and the very creation that we have been entrusted with. And how are we to serve? Again, Christ provides the clear answer. Where there are those that hunger, feed them. Where there are those that are naked, clothe them. Where there are those that are thirsty, quench their thirst. We worship a loving God. As we prepare for the return of Christ, we know that Christ lives in us and through us. Until the day we see our Lord again, we have been entrusted with God's creation, and we can ready ourselves for Christ's return by stepping into a world, into a nation, into our communities that are so desperately in need of healing. By acting into the lives of those that hunger and by making the presence of Christ known in those lives. Amen.
your microphones to join us in prayer. We will respond to each petition with, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. So let us pray. God of light, grant that we become ardent searchers for your godly presence in this world. May we be unrelenting in our quest to find you in our own hearts and in the hearts of our neighbor. Make us seekers of your divine light and a beacon for those enclosed in darkness. Lord, in your mercy. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Redeeming God, quell the restlessness of our nation. Heal the division in our communities. Restore to our hearts hope, faith, and love so that we act with grace and mercy where division and strife persist, so that we speak with compassion where words of hate exist, and that we humble ourselves, surrendering to the will of God in our lives. Lord, in your mercy, hear yeah. our prayer. Lord of healing, as this virus persists, as families and communities struggle with compromised health, financial concerns, the fragmentation of life and grief associated with the loss of loved ones. <clears throat> Remember our community, especially Mary Hayes at the death of her brother, William. Leon Rodriguez at news of his mother, Agnes's cancer diagnosis. For Robert and Julie Peterson at the death of Julie's mom, Jean, and Julie's upcoming surgery. We continue to pray for Terry Fretheim, Cole Binder, and Hans Wiersma, that healing may attend them. May we know that we have been called and equipped in this life as we make our way to the life to come. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear our yeah. prayer. Into your hands, gracious God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. There are blessings meant for you to hold on to. Clutched like a lifeline, carried like a candle for a dark way, tucked into a pocket like a smooth stone, reminding you that you do not go alone. This blessing is not those. This blessing will find its form only as you give it away. Only as you release it into the keeping of another. Only as you let it leave you. Bearing the shape, the imprint, the grace it will take. Only for having passed through your two particular hands. May God's blessing, source, word, and spirit one, keep, lead, and mold you now and forever. Amen. Amen. Amen.
in peace to love and serve. Thanks Thanks be to God. God. Thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you, Eric, for that powerful word. Thank you, Daphne, for leading us. Thank you, Tom and Mary, for the wonderful music. And thank you, Jamie Gertz, for making those slides keep flipping across the screen. We really appreciate it.